I feel when it comes to when it comes to prosecution in cases of when it comes to sex trafficking, more in-depth research and patience needs to be done. And America needs to stop criminalizing the actual victims and really separate trafficker from victim. Hello, and welcome to Prestige's podcast vodcast series, Sex, Human Rights, and CSA Prevention. Today we're talking to Kebriana, a trafficking victim who will be telling us her story. So, uh, just jumping right in, firstly, uh, you were trafficked as a minor. Can you talk about what led up to that and what the abuse and exploitation was like? Yes, um, so I guess I was introduced to this, all of this started at 17. Um, I was introduced into the lifestyle at 17 years old um, by actually an older friend of mine. She was an exotic dancer, and um, one day she was going to one of her customers' house from work, so I got along with her. I was waiting in the living room, and then once I got there, he was like, um, she came back to me, and she was like, um, he wants to know if you want to see him. Um, do you want to make some money? So, and I was young and impressionable and this girl, she was about 20, 22, 21 years old. So I went along with it and that was my first time, you know, ever, ever being paid for, for sex. Later on that year, I ended up meeting a guy and he, I was 17, he was 27. So he was older, um, he sold drugs, things of that sort. So I basically, I guess I fell in love, you know? Um, he told me all the good things I wanted to hear and all of that good stuff. What I didn't know, we would take a lot of trips down to, cause I lived in Cocoa Beach, Florida, and that was about four hours from Miami. So what I did not know what we were doing, um, He would, like, three to four times a week, we would drive to Miami, and he would have a few people in the car. And I just knew that we would have to drop people off to the doctor. And, you know, he would go and take me to get my nails done, distract me, whatever, and I just knew I was going to Miami to have some fun. Come to find out, we were doctor shopping. Um, And he would bring me back to hotels, and I remember, like, counting out all of these different pills and just stuff like that. But um, I just grew, like, fond of him. Like, he, he, like I said, he just filled my head with so many promises and, you know, things like that. Um, I eventually moved to Miami. I moved to Miami, and um, I didn't stay there too long. I ended up moving back to Cocoa Beach, Florida. Um by this time I was 18 years old and I ran into the same guy and this was basically like this was the first person I I can say was like a not a high school love but you know like a a young love like so he left an impression on me um I I went back and he wasn't just selling drugs anymore um he had an escort service so I was like, um, I didn't really stay around that too much. Um, I've, I had saw him in and out at different times, um, hanging out and stuff. Um, I was mostly me and my friend were living together and she was an exotic dancer. Um, so basically we, uh, me and her really didn't get along as well. Um, at 18, so this was when I was 18. Um, that year, I ended up going to a party, and I was raped. I was assaulted um, by two guys. I didn't know how long that was happening. I woke up, and um, one of them was penetrating me. The other was, um, like, on the side messing with my breast. So... I, I remember I, I got up, I put my clothes on, and um, I went and I filed a police report. Um, once I did that, you know, um, 
kind of like the community I was hanging around in. Everyone knew these guys that had, you know, done it. And I got the backlash. I got the back end of everything. Um, I was the one ostracized. I was the one that was called a whore and a liar. And I went through that whole ordeal alone. Um, my... My friend, the one that I was living with, um, she kind of let the social issues in the community influence her. So she really wasn't on my side and giving me that support that I, that I really needed. Um, I met with the prosecutor. I remember meeting with the prosecutor and the prosecutor wanted me to tell him when this person, when person A and person B penetrated me. Now. I would have been fully aware of that if I were conscious, but, you know, being that I was passed out, I woke up and this was happening to me. So I only knew that person B was penetrating me. You get what I'm saying? So anyways, the charges were dropped. Um, so I got into a really deep depression. I started using drugs really bad at that time and it was just to cope I didn't feel like you know I had anyone to be there sorry so the go ahead and settle before you start talking again okay so I remember calling my dad when this happened the like this uh, right after I came from the police department and he was like you shouldn't have put yourself in that situation like why would you put yourself in that situation so that right there that that broke me you know and it's like I felt like you know I didn't have anyone and mind you at 14 years old I was molested by a family member so this is just continued with abuse. Can you hear me? Good. Okay. I don't know why it's breaking up. So this has just been continued abuse. Um. So now I'll jump to to the to the fact I'm on drugs. Ever like, I have no one in my corner. No one's there. Me and my friend that I was living with. Me and her are no longer really getting along. Whatever issues we had. So. Um, the house that we were living in, she she went her way, I went my way. I couldn't afford the bills on my own. So now I'm really, I have nowhere to go. And I told you at this point in time, like I was just trying to cope with my rape. So I was on drugs really bad. And I guess my parents didn't realize that, you know, they were kind of, the, they were the type to just sweep it under the rug and keep it moving. So they're not realizing that this is what's, you know, the issue. Um, so they were like, you know, we don't want you at, at the house. Like you, you just, you're not welcome here. So now I don't have anywhere to go and I'm living out the trunk of my car, couch surfing from friend to friend. And guess who's, who's there? The guy that I met when I was 17. So, um, he was like, you know, just come, come. I have some hotels that I keep, you know, some of the other young women in. Come stay, and if they have calls, you can just drive them to, to their calls because you have a car. So I said, okay. That didn't last for long. He had about 11 other women working for him. He, he like, kept them in different hotels. A lot of them, he... He actually networked and, and got them from his drug clientele. These were women that were strung out on drugs. So basically, he's making double the money, you know. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of these women were, like, shooting up and et cetera, everything. Right. Um, so it really wasn't long until he started making me work as well. Um, oh, now it's time to earn your keep. Um, don't you want to be a part of this family? Because that's that's how traffickers tend to, um, you know, describe what what this is, or or they they consider it a family. Right, grooming and, on top of trafficking. That's crazy. Exactly. Wow. And um, 
he would always like he would prance me around and always tell people, oh, you know, I raised her like I've had her since she was 17. And, I, you know, what a thing to brag about. <laughs> yeah, so wonderful. So so I'm, I don't want to cut you off too much, but I want to uh, move a little bit forward if we can to uh, you yeah. were eventually arrested. Yes. 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 And so, uh, go ahead and tell me, like, what the, like, what led up to the arrest, what the charges were, if you're comfortable talking about that. No, I'm, I'm more than fine. I was just laying the groundwork for what, you know, what led up to it. So, um, anyways, he ended up going to prison, and I had been back and forth between dealing with him and not dealing with him, going to rehabs. You know, so finally he went to prison. It wasn't for the sex trafficking charge yet. He had went to prison on a drug-related charge, so I was able to just start my life, didn't have him distracting me, and, you know, I started working. I eventually lost my job, and um, I remember I had a friend that I met in a rehab prior, and so me and her, we started working together. In this lifestyle, like, you know, if you don't want to have a pimp and anything like that, basically accountability is very important and it, it's it's a safer, you know, environment when someone knows where you're at, you know, because a lot of a lot of women get hurt in, in the, this type of lifestyle. So I just, you know, liked working with another girl. Um, me and her started working together. Um, we eventually, you know, started living together. Um and when you say working together, you mean sex work? Is that correct? Yes, escorting. Yes, escorting. I was 21. She was 21 as well. Um, also, in the midst of all of this, um, we had, like, mutual friends. And in that, in that like, in the sex work, like, everyone kind of knows everyone. So, like, you know, I knew other girls that were working. Other girls knew me that was working. So... Sometimes I would stay with them. Sometimes I would let them come stay with me. It was, you know, it was, that's how it was. So through our network of friends, another, um, we had, we got introduced to this girl who needed a place to stay. She, um, so I let her come to my house a few days after her being there. I realized, you know, I don't think that you're, you know, of age. So I asked her, I was like, how old are you? And she was like, well, I'm 16. And I was like, well, listen, um, I don't think it's good for you to be here right now. So I I was like, let me know a place where I can take you. So I took her to the place where she asked me to drop her off to. Um, she still kept in contact back and forth. And part of me, I worried about her because I knew how it was for me when I was out there at a young age. And I didn't want her to get taken advantage of. So she would still come back to my house at times when she needed to, a place to stay. I always had my house open to her. So, um, in the midst of all of that, one of my neighbors where I lived at prior, he, he was also a drug dealer and he had just gotten out of uh, jail. He needed a place to stay. So I just allowed him to, you know, come and stay with me. He was 37 and at this time, um, yeah, he's near 40 and I'm 21 at this time. So while he's staying with me, you know, like the first, within the first month we started, you know, a sexual relationship and that's when the abuse started. So now I'm getting abused on a daily basis. Um, my friend, the 21 year old, she's witnessing all of this is when times I've asked her to call the cops. She's never like, you know, she'll call and then I'll tell her don't call. Like it's gotten bad. I had two wonderful dogs and I still have them till this day, but he would lock my, my dog in the cage and feed her ecstasy and make her really angry, yes. Um, at times when he was fighting me and beating me up, my dogs, they would try to like protect me. And I remember he would swing them across the floor, just any anything, like he would choke my dog up if I'm not doing what he's asking me to do. Mind you, he stayed in my house. I'm paying all of the bills. He's not helping support me and he's still, you know, I'm still giving him money. So at this point, I'm just getting taken advantage of or for, you know, and I didn't think that he was going to stay that long. I kept thinking if I give him more money, he'll leave, you know. But that's not how it worked out. Um, one day, 
the 16 year old she asked to come over and i was like okay that's fine i didn't because he would leave and come back we would argue leave and come back so at that extended amount of time at that point in time he had been gone for a few days so i was like sure yeah you can come over um she got there and she was there for like a day or so and then he ended up coming coming back um about a week into it um into her being there and, and you know i'm still continuing my life i'm still escorting my friends are escorting there um he just he realizes like i guess how much money is coming in and what people or what we're making and so he was he basically strong armed the whole situation he was like um if y'all are gonna be here y'all are gonna pay me and so i'm like yeah i'm like okay this is what we're doing and you know mind you i'm in an abusive relationship how am i supposed to take up for anyone else you know at the time and i can barely you know take up for myself there's been times i've called the cops on him he's beat me unconscious so once the cops got there i wasn't even able to open the door wow so long story short um this had gone on for like a month and he is the abuse not only extended from me it started extending to them as well right um my friend the 21 year old her friends you know because we would call them sometimes and let them know what's going on anyways her friends ended up calling the cops and reporting what was going on and you know which is something i'm i was grateful for but in the midst of all of that, once the cops got involved, um, the 16-year-old cooperated, the 21-year-old cooperated. In the beginning, I was afraid because I was the one that was closest to him. He knew my family. He knew where they lived at. He was also a drug dealer, and he was dealing with, you know, some, some pretty serious guys. So he and could have done a lot of damage. Yes. And when the cops got there, they wanted me to tell them everything. They're like, when they, when they came to my house, they're like, we, you need to, you are a victim. You need to consider yourself a victim in this situation and you need to help us. So, but then they wanted to know about the drug dealers and this and that. And I, you know, I was, I was afraid. So, um, I sat there for about four months. And before I decided, you know, I need to say something. And um, by the time I, I got around to, to wanting to speak and, and get to the prosecutors and everything, um, it's really, I, I guess I kind of pissed them off, you know. I kind of frustrated them upon not cooperating at the beginning. And so they were like, well, we're only going to, at this point, we're going to just give you conspiracy of sex trafficking. So... People, society does not realize how much abuse and threats go into into this lifestyle. Like a lot of women and young girls are afraid to speak up against their traffickers or against their abusers because of threat of harm and everything. And no, there isn't enough patience involved when it comes to law enforcement and trying to help they're constantly trying to convict trying to convict and so they re-traumatize a lot of victims when they do that exactly and let me share this with you so mind you they're there to help but what what type of help are you giving after the fact what therapy what resources are you providing the 16 year old from my case Two years later, she is now, she had, she got a sex trafficking charge. She had sex trafficking of minor, okay? In the same, in the same state, the same everything. Um, usually it's the human trafficking force in the Southern District of Florida. That's who handles all of those cases. Those are usually federal. The state usually hands it over to the federal, to the federal um, to the federal level but coincidentally when they matched it up and they realized that this was the same minor involved in a case two years ago the feds they didn't want to touch it they just gave it back to the state wow so 
That's you know, amazing. And, and I'll, I'll send you a link on that later on so you can read up if you like. Absolutely. That'd um, be cool. So she ended up doing about like two years. And um, I really, I don't know as of now. I know she's out, but I don't really know what else is going on with her. But it's like, what help did you give her? You know? I mean, what help did they give you? Like at this point in your life, have you had any counseling or anything like that for your abuse? Or has it all just been survival from one thing to the next and not being able to actually like process that it wasn't until I went to prison and really once you go to prison it's your choice on what you want to do when you walk into those gates you have a choice whether you want to do the right thing or whether you want to do the wrong thing or whether you want to build up from here you know and I can say in the federal system there really isn't a lot of resources to give a woman that has been a victim of trafficking or you know they have domestic violence abuse classes they have a lot of different stuff like that but when I got there I realized that um, I wasn't the only girl there with with sex trafficking there were more and more younger girls coming in one of the girls that I, I, I met her her public defender was disbarred because when she was 17, she caught her case at 18. When she was 17, he was paying her for sex. So she got 14 years in prison for sex trafficking, but the, she, they waited three months to indict her at 18 years old, but she was, she was um, escorting with two other girls that she grew up with. They were 15 and 16, and this girl was 17. They all grew up together. So all minors so they in that case. Giving her Yes, and they waited till she turned 18 to indict her. Three months after she turned 18, they give her 14 years. So when they go to court and they realize that her public defender, the one that is representing her, is uh, um, was paying her for sex, due to the allegations, he just surrendered his law license. Can you tell me, if you were really gu not guilty of something, would you surrender your law license? That's the only thing that happened to him. Okay, so I want to uh, continue a little bit along... Um, so this is something that I'm a little bit passionate about, the sex offender registry. Is that, so what would you like to tell us about the sex offender registry, your experience? Okay, so with that, I'm put in the same category as a predator, as a child predator, as a rapist. Um, each state has, uh, there are three tiers in each state. Um, each tier, depending on the state, it's you have to register for 10 years, 25, and then life. Wow. Human trafficking falls under the third tier, which is life. So even after I'm done with probation and my whole case, I still have to register for, for a lifetime period. Also, um, I have to go in and re-register I have to go in and check in every three months other 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 cases every six months to every year other tiers so they have people that have you know um basically molested children the same people that abused me as a child and you know when I was 18 years old and they're like lower tiers you know one and two. Oh wow that's Whereas wow I'm the highest tier. I have to send postcards out to everyone within a mile radius of my home whenever I move, which I come out of pocket for. I had to pay $265 for that. Um, wow. I have to run an ad in the newspaper to let them know that I'm a sex offender. Um, I had to do that in two different newspapers. Um, basically, it's like, you know, on my ID, it's there. So I'm constantly being branded. Like, I've already been put down so much due to, okay, so people already look at you at the bottom of the barrel, like, you know, because if you're a prostitute. And then, you know, then someone coming from sex abuse. Then someone coming from rape. Then someone coming from an abusive relationship. Like, I'm constantly being put down and put down. And then on top of that, I have to register. How much, how, how much more embarrassment do you want me to have? It's so much stigma, and it's so unfair, and I can't tell you just how sorry I am for what you've been through, what has happened, just all of that. It is so unfair, and your story is so incredible. And the last thing I want to get to before we're done 
is the kind of amazing ways that you are getting back on your feet and figuring things out. I believe you have, you're working on building a business and you're in school. I would love for you to talk about that. Okay. So, um, while I was in prison, I, I took a cosmetology course and I still went to college while I was in prison. Um, so the cosmetology course, it's registered in the state of Florida. So once you complete the, the course, you, you can take this, the Florida state board, a proctor comes in and administers the test to you. Um, because you're in prison, you have to put in an application and state what your reason for being incarcerated. My class, I was incarcerated with a few people that had drug trafficking and of, of that sort. I was incarcerated with someone who had attempted murder. She kidnapped a prostitute and tried to kill her in efforts of faking her own death to avoid prosecution for a pending drug charge that she had. Oh my goodness. That being said, everyone in my class got approved to take their state board. Now, I've worked 16 months hard for this. The state board did not approve me because they said that sex trafficking relates to the crime, that, that sex trafficking relates to the field of cosmetology. What type of um, rehabilitation do you expect me to have? I've never really held a real job. This is a trade that can take me. It wasn't until I appealed the case and I explained to them, I educated them on what sex trafficking is and, and what my case was. And I sent them all of the paperwork that I was once approved. So now I can, I'm able to sit at the State Board of Florida and take my college cosmetology exam. That's one thing I'm um, looking forward to. I also received my vet assistant certification and I'm in college right now. I'm in my second semester of college. I am going to pursue associates of science and then transfer to a university to uh, pursue pre-veterinarian medic uh, medicine. I started my own business. It's called Poshy Pets. Um, I specialize in bath bombs, uh, LED collars for dogs. It's basically everything to cut your pet's um, hygiene ritual in half. So like uh, I have pet bath bombs, I have organic mud masks, um, tooth, toothpaste, just different little stuff like that. Um, that sounds it's delightful. It's hard kind of getting it off the ground. <laughs> Thank you. It's hard kind of getting it off the ground. So I've also created a GoFundMe page to help, you know, um, support my business and to help me, you know, get products and different things like that. That's, that's amazing. I mean, the work that you've done and that you're still fighting, so many people would be just bowled over by this and you're just so strong and I want to thank you for talking to us today and I wanted to know if you had like just one last thing you'd like to say if you could distill things down into like one last statement about let's see uh just what you've been through um I feel when it comes to when it comes to prosecution in cases of when it comes to sex trafficking more in-depth research and patience needs to be done and America needs to stop criminalizing the actual victims and really separate trafficker from victim. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Sex, Human Rights, and CSA Prevention. Don't miss out. Click to subscribe. You can also donate to support our work. Thanks. Bye for now.